Okay, we are um, Master Gardeners through the K-State Research and Extension, which is a part of Kansas State University. Uh, the training that we receive to be Master Gardeners is 40 or 50 hours of uh, lectures and classes that are presented by specialists from KU. A lot of them are professors at, at K-State, also the local agents like Matt and uh, Rebecca McMahon, several others will give lectures to us. And in exchange for all that great education, um, we volunteer so many hours a year. And this is part of my volunteer activity for uh, this week. Anyway, everybody is invited to participate. All the materials are free and uh, open to anyone who is interested. So let's get into the topic. Um, the topic, I actually kind of gave away the whole, the whole talk in the title, and that is because you can't have soil without living microbes in there. And it's not just one kind of microbes, it's a lot of microbes. Uh, not just bacteria, there's fungus are very important. The mycorrhizae hyphae that connects uh, plant to plant. It's like a communication system below ground. Uh, bacteria, viruses, um, little tiny bugs, sow bugs, earthworms, they're all part of what you need to turn dead dirt into living soil. Um, those are a couple of pictures from back when I didn't have gray hair and worked in the medical laboratory. We, we got tons of specimens every day and they were anything that came out of or from a human body. Um, a lot of urine cultures, skin, wounds, strep screens. Um, anytime you had a culture taken at the doctor, it came to a lab like this where we inoculated uh, auger plates if we were looking for bacteria, isolate us, uh, put them in incubators overnight and then read the plates later. The picture in the lower uh, left-hand corner is a plate that was incubated overnight from a urine culture. And it shows a lot of growth, meaning that person has had a urinary tract infection. So my job at that point was to identify the bacteria, decide whether it was something that was pathogenic, was causing an infection, obviously in a urine, you shouldn't have any bacteria. So uh, that is a pathogenic bacteria there. We would identify it and find out what antibiotics to treat it with and send that report to the doctor. Um, depending on the source of the specimen, we might set up 14 different kinds of isolation media to figure out what was uh, growing, whether it was a virus or a fungus or bacteria. Um, it was always a mystery and always a challenge. And that's what I loved about it because you couldn't ever predict what was coming through the door that day or what you might find in it after you uh, incubated it. So um, on the right-hand side, you see what some of those auger plates looked like after they were incubated. Um, on the inside of your body, almost every part of your body is sterile except the parts where food goes in and food comes back out. <laughs> so your digestive tract has bacteria in it. All the rest of your organs should be sterile. Your heart, your lungs, your kidneys, there shouldn't be any bacteria anywhere. But when you're swabbing somebody's skin, like the plate in the upper uh, right-hand corner has multiple different looking colony types. And each one of those little dots there are a different kind of bacteria. We have to determine, is that normal bacteria that belongs in that site or is it something that's uh, uh, out of place? If it's out of place, it's like a weed. Um, in the right place, it's fine, but when it's growing in the wrong place, it's a problem. So the bottom uh, right hand where my cursor is, I hope you can see that, is a fungus culture from somebody's toenails, which is where I first made the connection that the things that infect your tomato plants, the verticillium and fusarium are the same things that you will find in toenail clippings <laughs> often on people's feet. Uh, they don't really cause a problem in your toenails. They, they aren't capable of infecting your toenails, but they, uh, if your feet are dirty, you may have them underneath there. So my question is, did you give them to your tomatoes or did the tomatoes give them to your feet? But each of those we would make a prep from and look at it in the microscope to determine 
um, as many characteristics as we could about it to, to try to begin the identification process. So on the lower left, where you can see there's long blue forms, there's short red forms, there's round forms, there's uh, some chains of bacteria. Uh, that is like a throat swab where you have multiple kinds of bacteria there all the time. And they each have a function in your mouth and in your throat uh, that helps start digesting your food before it even gets to your stomach. That's one of the jobs that they have. Um, another one of the function of having bacteria in your mouth is that it keeps the bad bacteria out. It's like nature abhors a vacuum. So what you want is to be filled with good bacteria that will block any bad bacteria from getting in. And for the most part, that does a, a really good job because you can find this much bacteria in your mouth. You go a few inches down further into your throat and it's sterile. So all of that pretty much stays in your mouth and your upper throat. The picture up here, I think is kind of an interesting one because it's all one kind of bacteria, but if you look at them, you see the little halos around each of those dark rods. Each of those are an individual bacteria and those bacteria um, produce a slime. That particular strain has a, like a slimy coat and you can actually see it around each individual bacteria. In the soil, when you have bacteria that are capable of doing that, they help create the aggregates in soil. They're, they are part of the glue that forms to make uh, particles of clay and silt and sand bond together into little chunks and create air passages in the soil. In your body, those coatings over the bacteria um, pretty much protect the bacteria from other organisms killing it, but it also creates the mucus lining in your gut, which helps protect the rest of your body from all the organisms that you have growing in your gut. So um, it has a function in the soil and it has a function in your body just the same. These plates here show um, it's group A strep. If you've ever had strep throat, you know that it makes your throat really hurt. You can see how these are blood auger plates and each of those little colonies has completely lysed the red blood cells underneath it, made, it, made it look clear. Uh, that's how come it irritates your throat so much. Those organisms are actually able and capable of rupturing cells in your body and causing damage. So uh, you can see it on the auger and you can feel it in your throat. So I get really fascinated by all of these things and I learned a lot about what parts of, of your body, what the normal organisms are. Um, they vary. Your skin does not have the same organisms that your mouth has. Your mouth does not have the same ones that your intestinal tract has, uh, but they each serve a role in the place where they're found. So the way, when I first started in the laboratory, um, back in the dark ages, we had to identify bacteria by doing tests in tubes, test tubes. For one, to, to identify one microbe, we might have to inoculate 30 or 40 separate tests and then see how they reacted, what kind of reaction they had in that test, and then use a chart to figure out from there what the organism actually was. Um, so it was very hands-on. It took a lot of people, um, and you did not get results very quickly. Usually it took a minimum of 48 hours from when the culture came in before we could identify an organism. Um, the next improvement that came along were the things you see in the middle, which are basically, they're strips of plastic with these little cupules. Each of these little ovals is a cupule that holds liquid. And we would take an organism that we wanted to identify put it in some sterile water and then fill each one of these little cups up to the line there with that organism, incubate it for 18 hours and then see what colors they produced. Um, each of those is like on this side of the strip, a yellow color is a positive reaction, meaning this organism, Cleb Pneumo has all the enzymes to break down practically every sugar you can think of. So it's a very active organism. Down here is Proteus mirabilis it can't utilize very many sugars at all. There's some that 
do most sugars, but not all. But anyway, each organism has a completely different pattern of what enzymes it has, what sugars it can digest, um, what food in your body can it, it can digest. So there's different fats, there's different kinds of sugars, carbohydrates all in your diet, and something has to help you digest them. So one organism is never going to have all of the enzymes that you need in order to break that down. So you need a whole community of them to make the best use of the food that you're eating. Now, right before I retired, uh, we went to another method that's amazing and fantastic and blows your mind when you started out with tubes like this. And now on this little microscope slide, every two, two dots is one organism. So they can identify a couple dozen of them off of one single microscope slide that goes in, in, into an instrument and gets zapped by a laser and blasted into pieces. And then it analyzes the pieces to come up with an identification. So all of this hard earned knowledge that I had of memorizing which organisms were urease positive and which ones were citrate negative and glucose positive, uh, all of that's totally irrelevant now because it's all done by lasers. It's only when the lasers don't work, we go to, back to the manual methods and, and have to use those. But anyway, that's how I got to realize why it is so important that you have a, a very good mixed, diverse flora in your intestinal tract to, to digest your food. Soil is the same way. To digest an oak leaf is different than digesting an elm leaf or a twig. All of those require a mix of organisms, <coughs> excuse me, that are each um, able to digest at least part of uh, what they're presented with. Lori, we had a question. Um, someone wanted to know what are the rose pink splotches in the lower left um, part of your first slide, I believe. These that oh, these here are white blood cells. So those are uh, the organisms that are always patrolling your throat and other entrances and exit wound, uh, to, to eat up anybody that comes in that doesn't belong. So <laughs> when we make a slide like this, we kind of look to see if there's bacteria that's stuck in the white cell. And that gives us a clue that that organism is most likely a pathogen because it's being eaten by the white blood cell. The white blood cell has recognized it as something that shouldn't be there. So that's kind of interesting. <laughs> To me anyway. So I think they've actually figured out that you have more like 3,000 different species of bacteria and fungus like yeasts in your gut that help protect and maintain the lining of your intestine. And so it's actually 30% of your poop is nothing but bacteria. That's good. It's kind of a shocking percentage, but that's the way it is. They multiply so fast. It's just when it boggles the mind when you think how tiny each of those bacteria is and how many of them it has to, it has to be in your intestine to uh, produce something like that. And the only thing that comes even close to having that number and that diversity of bacteria is soil. Um, so there are similarities right there between um, soil and the intestinal tract is that the um, um, lining, the, the, they call it a biofilm that forms from all the secretions, activities of all of these microbes form a lining on your intestine that prevent anything from breaking through your intestine, leaking into your bloodstream and causing uh, other issues of inflammation in your body or uh, leading to allergies and things like that. Having a, a, a lining that is um, protective and full of bacteria will help um, your health be much better. <laughs> and the same thing is in the soil. If you don't have all the microbes, a mix, a diverse population, they don't, they don't have the uh, secretions and the nutrients and all the things that are needed to form the texture of soil that you need to be healthy. It, you don't have the organisms that you need to produce the food that goes to the plants. The plants cannot eat anything unless the microbes digest it and, and basically feed it to them. So there's, it's really important to have a diverse group, um, as diverse as you can possibly get. The way you get that is eating a, a diet of a lot of different organisms. Basically, if you have a, a diet of fat and sugar, 
the microbes in your gut are going to adapt to be the ones who can digest fat and sugar. Um, you're not going to have the other microbes that could digest uh, the fiber um, in, in uh, beans, for example. If you eat a really bad diet all the time and then you eat a bunch of beans, you know what happens. <laughs> you don't digest them very well. So uh, keeping the good bacteria there requires feeding it a lot of different things all the time and not eating just the same thing day after day. Um, the good bacteria um, are the ones you want to encourage. The bad ones are almost always present in very small amounts in your gut, but having the good bacteria there to keep them in balance, um, make sure they don't cause problems. If you've ever been hospitalized and got antibiotics, you might've heard about Clostridium difficile. Is like you get hit with massive diarrhea after you've been on antibiotics or been in the hospital sometimes and they say you you've got c diff well those it's not that you got it from the hospital necessarily those bacteria were in your gut but the, when they put you on antibiotics for whatever reason they killed off all the good bacteria and that allowed the c diff to take over and make you sick um so antib antibiotics are a great thing they're really needed uh, to cure a lot of infections and stuff, but you do have to realize after you've finished some of those medications that your diet is really going to help you get back to normal faster. Um, so you get an imbalance. It can be from your diet. It can be from medications other than antibiotics also can, can affect it. Uh, alcohol, food poisoning, infections, um, sepsis, things like that uh, can all create imbalances that are uh, hard to treat. One of the articles I read recently that I thought was, was amazing was that they have shown that you don't get all the nutrients that you need. There's like 16 different amino acids I think that you need that are vital uh, that you have to get from your food. And because we aren't eating as diversely as we should, um, that affects the diversity of our gut population. And the second paragraph down here where it says over the last 50 years, by reducing agro diversity, changes in farming have reduced dietary diversity, which means when they used to have small family farms, when 85% of the population lived on farms, people ate seasonally. They ate what they grew that season or what they stored over winter. They didn't eat the, you know, you didn't eat fresh strawberries in the middle of winter. You ate them in May and June when they were ripe. Um, so we eat things out of season and we eat the same things over and over, which they didn't have that option because you didn't have the same kinds of foods available year round. So it's been interesting that they can show how the diet has affected um, that for, for us. Another one that I thought was really fascinating was how this one says probiotics may boost learning and memory in Alzheimer's patients. Um, so these were people who were given probiotics every day for 12 weeks, um, which shows that if you feed the good things in your body, it can help counteract a lot of the bad things that uh, uh, you encounter. It's, it's like an insurance plan that helps you cope with whatever comes up. The increase in metabolic disorders and diabetes and, and cancer and allergies and asthma, um, all of those have a link to gut health. And so the more you focus on diet, the more you can reduce the incidence of having some of those complicating uh, diseases. There's another yeah. question, Lori. Yeah. Um, someone wants to ask if certain bacteria are needed for health, how do we know which bacteria we are low in to improve allergies to certain foods? Uh, that's uh, allergies. Once they've developed, I don't know that you're, you know, that you can fix them in the same way that you can prevent them. And that's um, most foods that you eat, if you eat fresh and raw foods, they already have the bacteria that you need to digest them on them. Like the 
broccoli and the grapes like when they when they harvest grapes you know they have that little blush on the skin that's actually yeast that lands on the skin of the grapes that creates that that blush on it and that's what ferments the grapes into wine so almost anything that you can eat um, will have some of the bacteria that your body needs in order to digest it so you're going to consume the right bacteria um, that goes along with what you eat. Does that make sense? <laughs> so anyway, uh, the less processed that you eat, you're going to get, because it's less processed, you're more likely to get those healthy microbes that you're looking for that you need to digest um, particular fats and, and starches and stuff like that. So a poor diet, you'll end up with less diversity. Um, They've actually shown people who have who have gotten home from the hospital after having coronavirus, they did a study of their gut flora and found out that it was way out of whack. And I don't know, and these were the people that had the long-term effects from COVID that have the, are the long haulers, had the most disruption in their gut flora. People who got out of the hospital and started feeling better faster had better gut diversity than the ones who had long-term COVID. So I don't know whether it's, you know, they were in the hospital, they got a lot of medications, they got a lot of antibiotics. That may have be, been what was the disruptive thing, but they did find that if you started probiotics immediately upon getting out of the hospital, regrowing that normal flora as quickly as possible, those people did not experience the long-term uh, uh, the long haul COVID if they were able to reestablish their <clears throat> intestinal flora. So I thought that was fascinating to, to read that. It was just a very recent study. So, you know, I'm talking about the gut a lot, but we kind of are talking about soil improvement and what you can do to make your soil better. So I guess I better get back to that here. Um, like I'm saying how the gut processes and absorbs the nutrients and water that you need uh, to stay healthy. Good soil is the same thing. It processes and breaks down organic matter, turning some of that into food that it can provide to the plants, turning some of it into humic acids, which can uh, tie up carbon and uh, be a really good carbon sink for all of this excess CO2 that's the, that is in the atmosphere affecting our climate. Um, any organic matter that you incorporate into the soil, compost that you make, um, stabilizes the carbon and the other nutrients and holds on to them in a, a really good fashion for long-term storage of carbon. And they've they've done some studies that if more people, if if uh, the land that is capable of having organic matter to it was all uh, utilized properly. Um, it could have an amazing, huge, the biggest effect on carbon uh, dioxide in the atmosphere of practically anything on earth. So um, when you're composting and improving your soil, you're not only improving just your soil, but you're actually uh, part of the solution for climate change. You think that a compost pile is, you know, this microbe thing that it rots your food really fast. Well, your gut really, that's how your gut works. Your, it, it rots your food. That's, <laughs> it just does it really fast because in both, if you're trying to make a hot compost pile, you start by chopping everything into really small pieces. Well, you've chewed your food into really small pieces before you swallow. So you started with uh, the same thing, organic material and breaking it down into small pieces. Once the food gets into your digestive tract, it becomes combined with bacteria, uh, actinomycetes, which are kind of half bacteria, half fungus, and then all of the yeasts and, and, and fungus that um, are also present. So um, your compost pile, those organisms come from the addition of a little bit of soil or from the materials themselves. A lot of times the, leaf, the grass clippings and leaves and stuff will have enough bacteria on them to, to jumpstart your, your compost. Um, but they're, they just multiply. Within seven hours, you have like a, a logarithmic growth where it's like 
uh, tenfold every uh, 30 minutes or so. You know, the number of bacteria just really zooms up fast and um, provides all of the compounds ultimately that we need for energy and growth, both for the human and for plants. So if it isn't clear yet what the difference between dirt and soil is, um, both are made of sand, silt, clay, rocks, pebbles. Um, dirt does not have much organic matter in it. It's dead. It's, it, um, living soil has, if you do a soil test, a good amount would be, you know, two to 5%, I think, is about uh, what healthy soil should have. So when you have dirt, you can't get plants to grow in dirt. Uh, when you have soil, uh, then you've got a chance at least to get plants to grow and produce. Um, when you have dirt, if it rains, you'll see the water beat up and, and, and run off of it, or it'll only penetrate like a little tiny ways down into the soil and it won't reach the roots before it's gone. Um, that will also lead to erosion when it does rain or the soil actually blowing away. Um, that's historically been a way where Kansas has lost a lot of erosion, or has, lo has lost a lot of soil due to erosion because we're a windy place. Um, so when the water runs off, it doesn't do any good to the, uh, what's below it. When you have soil, it has um, the ability to filter the water before it runs into uh, the rivers or needs to be treated it filters it, it stores water for longer term. If you have soil, it's going to resist drying out uh, during droughts as often, you know, as uh, quickly. It's going to um, lack all the essential minerals and nutrients that living organisms produce and that um, living plants require um, are in, in soil, but not in dirt. So. Um, basically, if it's been trampled a lot, if it's on the edge of your house where it's been driven over by the cars uh, or just, you know, run down by your dogs or pets or kids packing it down year after year, uh, that will turn soil into dirt. When it's packed down like that, there's no airspace, there's no place for the water to penetrate down, there's no place for uh, earthworms and, and other organisms to move around. They require the water to be able to move around. So the roots die. Once the roots die, um, plants die, um, you just plumb out of luck. So everybody probably has areas in their yard that are soil and some that are dirt. Hopefully nobody has a place that's all dirt. So you're going to have to feed it. If you want to turn dirt into soil, you're going to have to feed it. Um, the best place to start and the one that hardly anybody takes advantage of, but I would like to encourage you all to take a soil test. It's not hard to do if you have an area where if you want to start a new garden or where you want to do some landscaping or if it's an area where you've had plants die and you don't know what to do with it next, what what to know what will grow there, do a soil test. You take maybe 10 different places, random places in that area. Take a shovel, the nice straight-sided uh, shovel and take multiple samples, six, eight, 10 inches deep, mix them all together in a, in a bucket, um, mix them really well, and then allow it to dry out. If it's, if it's really wet, it's gonna have to dry before it can be tested. So spread it out or <clears throat> on a newspaper and let it dry or just let it sit until it's dry, mix it up. And then they need about two cups of soil for a soil test. So bring it in a container uh, to the Kansas State Extension office. It's at 21st and Ridge in Wichita. You fill out a request form, which will ask um, what you intend, you know, what you are trying to grow in that area. Uh, the recommendations, if you wanna plant trees in the lawn may be different for what your soil needs. If you then if you are going to make a vegetable garden out of it or a uh, turn it over to native plants, even knowing what the end use of the of of your area is intended to be will help them give the most specific um, 
information to you on what, what deficiencies you might need to correct. There may be specific additions that you need to adjust the pH or something like that in addition to adding organic matter. But the main thing is always organic matter. Um, they use, you know, tilling. If you have a tiller, some people are very big fans of tilling. Um, I'm getting kind of lazy as I get older and don't like doing as much digging. So I'm looking for a little lower uh, intensity way of, of introducing organic matter. But, but um, if you have really bad dirt and you want to turn it into soil, it's, it's really worth it to go through the, the tilling process to really work in as much organic matter as you can. And by organic matter, I mean um, grass clippings, uh, chopped leaves, the remains of um, plants that um, you pulled up at the end of the season, as long as they're healthy. If they, if they have a lot of disease in them, like if you had tomato plants that were pretty sick by the end of the summer, just throw those in the trash. Do not try to compost them because you're just adding organisms that are not good for your plants uh, into the compost. And if it doesn't get hot enough in your compost, those will persist and cause you more problems down the line. So don't put in things that are damaged, but uh, compost, finished compost is great. Green manure crops are wonderful. We will talk about those a little bit more um, in a little bit. Um, they used to have a lot of recommendations for double digging and it sounded like so much work that I think it really discouraged a lot of people from trying to build a, a vegetable patch or something in their yard. But really there are ways of, of introducing that organic matter that aren't as, as labor intensive. Um, just applying organic mulches on the surface of the soil and allowing the weathering and earthworms and insects to pull those um, organic materials down into the soil. Uh, it takes a little longer to do it that way, but it will improve them every, every year. Keep some organic stuff on the surface of your, your plant. Also, when you're taking, like when your peppers are done this summer, cut them off at the base and leave the roots in the soil and let those rot over the winter because those roots down in the soil, as they rot, will create air passages and passages for water and places for earthworms to go through and will just allow your soil to breathe a little better by leaving those, those there. Um, cover crops, um, you don't want any bare soil. Uh, naked soil is gonna get progressively worse. It's never gonna improve by being naked. So keep uh, cover crops like, Right now, if you have bare ground, you could put um, buckwheat seeds out and spread that. And within a month, it'll be ready to till under or, or just cut it off and let it lay on the surface of the soil so it covers the soil over winter. There's some that are better for, um, if, if, you're, if you've got really heavy clay, there's cover crops that will help break that up. Uh, you don't want to let most of the cover crops will, will die over winter and you can just leave that biomass, the dead material, lay in the garden right where it is. Um, that's probably the, the easiest thing to do. And all you have to do is a month before you're ready to plant in the spring, take your shovel and just quickly turn that under. Um, you don't have to go more than about six inches, eight inches deep at the most, just, just quickly flip that soil over and, and cover up the residue and a month later you'll be ready to plant. Or if you don't even wanna do that, you can just kind of move it aside, uh, it's dead, just move it aside and plant through it when you're ready. If you till it in, it's going to take some of the nitrogen in the soil to help finish breaking that down. So that is why you wanna till it in like a month before you're ready to plant because you don't want the nitrogen to be tied up working on the organic matter you just put in the soil. But if you leave it on the surface of the soil, that's not gonna tie up the nitrogen in the soil as much. So um, uh, that's the, the advantage of the two different ways of doing it. So the roots in place I said would rot and improve your soil texture. Um, also, almost all the bacteria are associated with roots, like nine, over 90% of all the bacteria in the soil is going to be right adjacent to root hairs. Uh, you get away from a root hair, there's no microbial activity. So um, if you lose those roots or you don't have roots, those microbes are going to 
are going to starve and you'll have to start over the next season again when you have new plants growing with new roots and hopefully um, uh, stimulate more organisms to regrow. But if you want to keep the microbial activity high and keep it going all year long, uh, keeping the soil covered with, with a green crop is always going to be uh, the best way of, of increasing the number of microbes. Also, um, anytime you use chemicals of any kind, which, you know, sometimes there's things where you just, you, you really need to spray to get rid of them. Um, but every time you do that, there are side effects. So you want to balance and use something that has the least negative side effects. Uh, glyphosate, I don't think most people know, but it was actually licensed as an antibiotic back in the 70s because that's uh, actually part of the way that it works is it kills the microbes in the soil uh, next to the root hairs. And because it kills those microbes, that is what starves the plant and causes the plant to die. So it's not a direct, so much of a direct effect on the plant that it's killing, it's killing the microbes and that kills the plants. So um, when you use inorganic fertilizers like, you know, miracle Grow or whatever kind of uh, fertilizer you get that's, that's uh, not, uh, comes from manure or, or a natural source, um, has salts in it that are toxic to earthworms and other invertebrates like that. So if you have applied a, a chemical fertilizer, you're not going to find as many uh, worms in your soil until that's had it, until that fertilizer has had a, a, a chance to really work down through the soil because I don't know if you've ever sprinkled salt on a slug, but uh, uh, it dehydrates them, it sucks all the water out of them and it kills them. And so basically when you're using those kind of chemicals, you're going to affect the um, microbes that are in your soil. And anytime you kill off the beneficials, just like I told you in the human gut, when you kill off your normal flora, it gets replaced by pathogenic things a lot of times. And that's, they see that with, with glyphosate. Um, you have a change in the microbes that are in the soil when you treat with, with Roundup um, or other, other chemicals. Um, and you end up with more fungus in the soil that are pathogenic fungus than you would find normally because they're taking advantage of the situation. There's, there's no healthy bacteria so they can move in and uh, give you problems with subsequent crops even though you didn't apply any Roundup to the subsequent things. You may still have effects from previous applications. Okay, so this is like the simple plan <laughs> for turning dirt. If you have a spot of dirt in your yard that you want to turn into, into a garden, let's say next spring, I think this would be a very reasonable plan for you to try. And that would be to go out there and take your weed whacker or your mower. If it's got grass, mow it um, as low as you can. You don't have to dig everything out unless it's like a big shrub. Um, pull that out. Um, but anyway, you can leave the what's what's there. Get your soil samples. Um, send that off because it'll take a month or two <clears throat> to get your results back. So if you want to be able to um, take whatever steps they recommend yet this fall, get your soil test done at the same time you're uh, preparing your, your spot. Then cover it with a tarp or heavy plastic for like four to six weeks. There's still time to do that yet if you if you wanted to this year. Uh, weight the edges of the tarp down with, you know, blocks, cement blocks or something so that it, it uh, keeps the ground covered well. And after, you know, especially in this heat, after four to six weeks, it should pretty much kill everything that's underneath that, that tarp. By the time, I mean, you can pick it up and, and peek underneath it every once in a while to see how it's coming along. But um, usually about a month is, is going to be good this time of year to, to kill whatever's under the tarp. And by then, hopefully, you'll have your soil test results. Um, my yard tends to be alkaline, and that means it's the pH is too high and needs to be brought lower. So it's uh, things like to acidify, like sulfurs and stuff like that. It would the soil test will tell me 
um, the amount that's needed to get that back in the range that it that uh, plants prefer to grow in. Um, it'll probably tell you if you're short on organic material, which if you've got dirt, you are going to be short of organic material. Um, anyway, if you my macronutrients, micronutrients, it'll measure all of those things and tell you what what you can add to improve them. A lot of those things are just basically uh, the organic materials that you're going to be adding maybe have enough in them to supply uh, the needs that, that you have for growing. If you don't, then there's ways of supplementing it. Uh, best plan, like if you had one or two seasons of cover crops, which let's say you mowed and you put a tarp down now, you waited a month, you got your results from your soil test and you added whatever amendments uh, were needed, you could plant a cover crop um, yet this fall, a quick growing one like, like maybe buckwheat, give it a month, till that in, and then you could plant a late season cover crop like, um, well, mid-September to the end of September is probably the best window for planting a, uh, an overwintering cover crop. And um, so you could actually get two crops of green manure into that dirt before next season. Um, the other alternative here is after you cut everything off, just use cardboard, uh, overlapping layers of cardboard, thick layers of newspaper. Uh, just lay that out over the area that you want to um, create a new garden in. Um, a couple inches of soil or mulch or shredded leaves or compost will hold that in place. If there's something that you want to plant this fall, which Fall is a good time for planting, you know, a lot of shrubs and things. Uh, you know, there are things that people want to plant in the fall. You can plant by cutting a hole right through the cardboard and, and planting it um, this fall. Or you can just let it sit with the newspaper, cardboard, mulch um, all through the winter until next spring. And by then, the cardboard actually breaks down pretty fast, but it does inhibit the weeds from growing through there while you're in the process of getting uh, this turned into a new garden. So is anybody have questions about that? Is there anybody who is interested in trying that this year? We do have a couple questions. Okay. So the first one is how often should one till a vegetable garden? Um, every time you till, you kind of break down the texture of the soil a little bit. So the least amount of tilling that you can do is what I would recommend. So generally it's like, if you're starting a brand new garden, tilling it to get all of that in, uh, organic matter as deep as you can into the soil at the beginning, that's your best chance and best opportunity uh, to incorporate those materials. But on a annual basis, if you're using mulch and keeping the ground covered all the time, your weed pressure should be minimal. You really don't have a lot of weeds to deal with, which is a lot of times why people are tilling is to, to try and get rid of weeds. But at the same time you're tilling the weeds down, you're also bringing up weed seeds from deeper in the soil that are now at the right height that they need to germinate. So you may just be encouraging a new crop of weeds to grow by tilling. So. Uh, unless you're really trying to mend the soil by adding some things that are missing, I'd say, you know, try not to till. Great. Okay, the next question is, what are some other cover crops besides buckwheat? Oh, I've got a whole bunch on that. Uh, actually, I've got this little video here. He's a, a cute little British guy, so he has a nice accent. <laughs> And uh, he will talk about cover crops. He mentions one that's uh, not really common in the US, but I will go over a chart with lots of cover crops on it right after this video. So let's see if we can get this going. Whoops, no. Well, it worked when we were playing with it before. There we go. Thank you. 
cover crops or green manures are a great way to protect soil that would otherwise lie bare over winter. Dig them in and they'll also help to build up your soil's organic content, which is great news for the vegetables that follow. Late summer is the perfect time to sow a cover crop for winter, and in this video we'll show you exactly how it's done. Cover crops are plants grown to protect or improve the ground for future crops. Keeping soil covered over winter protects it from erosion and helps support all the beneficial life associated with it. It also gives weeds less opportunity to establish, meaning cleaner beds for sowing and planting in spring. Dig the cover crop into the ground at the end of winter and it will rot down to add valuable organic matter, helping to feed the plants that follow. Cover crops with deep or fibrous roots such as cereal rye help to improve soil structure by breaking it up. Others like mustard grow very fast to produce lots of lush foliage that can be incorporated into the soil after just a few months to boost its organic content. Mustard is a particularly good cover crop for clay soil where it can be dug in before the winter so frosts have a chance to break up the soil. Prolific salads such as mash or corn salad may also be grown this way. Some cover crops directly add nutrients to the soil by fixing nitrogen at their roots. Examples include winter field beans and peas, clover and vetch. These are all types of legume and are a great choice for sowing before nitrogen hungry brassicas such as cabbage. Phacelia can be sown in late summer in milder areas or wait until spring if winters are cold where you are. Phacelia is very good at suppressing weeds and will improve your soil structure. The flowers are stunning and a major draw for bees and hoverflies, so consider leaving a small patch to flower to attract them. Buckwheat is another good example, offering numerous benefits for weed suppression, soil enrichment, and as a source of nectar for beneficial insects in spring. Check the planting times in our garden planner to pick the right cover crop sowing time for your area. To sow a cover crop, start by roughly digging the ground over. Remove all weeds, especially perennial ones. Tamp down the soil with the back of a rake, then scatter or broadcast your seeds evenly across the soil surface. Don't sow them too thickly. Rake the seeds into the soil, tamp down with the back of your rake, then water the ground if it's dry. The chunky seeds of winter field beans may also be sown in rows. Use a spade or hoe to dig out trenches about two inches or five centimetres deep. Space the trenches eight inches or 20 centimetres apart. Now sow the seeds so they're about four inches or 10 centimetres apart, then fill in the trenches to cover them. In most cases, it's best to dig your cover crop into the soil before it begins to flower, perhaps leaving a few for early beneficial insects. At this stage, the stems will still be soft, making them easier to cut up and dig in and quicker to rot down. Incorporate the foliage into the soil or simply cut it off and leave it on the surface as a mulch for the worms to dig in for you, covering it over with cardboard if you're concerned about weeds springing up. Cover crops should be dug in at least one month before sowing or planting so they have enough time to begin decomposing. Autumn sown cover crops are the best way to keep your soil in good health over winter and next season's vegetables, well they'll be all the happier for it. Now, if you've used a cover crop before, please tell us in the comments section below which one you used and Okay, we won't, we won't talk to him, but anyway, um, he mentioned a couple of things. The Phycelia that he mentioned, it had such pretty flowers. I looked that up and it's some kind of tansy uh, related thing. But anyway, this is the, the chart that K-State has of all the different things that you can use as cover crops with the advantages and disadvantages um on each of them so if you are planning on or wanting to use a, a cover crop this fall i would recommend um going to either your the feed and seed store or uh talk to one of the extent people at the extension office and they can give you recommendations depending on what your uh what your goal is and what you're looking for in a cover crop for example um if you needed a lot of biomass which is like just a lot of volume and you didn't have a bunch of leaves or organic matter um, available from your own yard to use uh, to till in to add organic matter something like this with a five means it's going to have produce a lot of mass so that would be something if you're looking for high volumes of of organic matter um, weed suppression 
all of them are are rate from good to excellent. Uh, heat, drought, those are all things to take into consideration. The quick growth is, is the one to look at right here for um, this time of year. We still have several months of, of growing season left, so it doesn't have to be instantaneous, but like I said, if you wanted to do one crop quickly, uh, one of these that's like a, a buckwheat or oats or millet or even the sorghum sedan grass, Bersim clover, sun hemp, all of those things grow fast. You could let them grow for a month or um, sometimes you can actually uh, kind of mow them and let them regrow a little bit um, and, and get extra growth out of them that way. Um, right now, I have some cover crops that I'm getting ready to use and um, I'm going to stop share here for just a second. So I can show you, I've got a bag of seed. It's a, a cover crop mix and it has a label on it that tells me all the things that are in it. And it has 27% wheat, 23% triticale, 22% Australian winter peas. There's some hairy vetch, some daikon radish, some bursine clover. Uh, yellow mustard and uh, balanza clover. So anyway, it's got like eight different things in there and they all will have various advantages, but I'm planning on planting this in, in mid-September and letting it die over the winter and then tilling it in next uh, uh, spring. I also have another kind of cover crop, which I came up with that I think is really cool because I have chickens. And this one is uh, a special ground cover mix that's a free range forage mix for chickens. So they love it. I planted it um, in some trays and grew it indoors up to about five inches tall. That took about a week for it to from to go from seed to being about five inches tall, took the tray out to my chickens and they demolished it in about five minutes, they ate it all. So I did plant in one area of the yard that's like between my garage and the fence is about, you know, a three foot wide path that, that basically is where I stack all my tomato cages and things over the winter. I decided to plant that with this cover crop for the chickens as a forage place for them and, uh, um, I let them in there for just, you know, small amounts of time. They really have enjoyed it, but it's also a way of keeping that ground covered over the winter and um, hopefully enriching it so I can plant something more meaningful than uh, the weeds that have been in there in the past. So anybody still have more cover crop, cover crop questions? There were some. Let me get back to them. Yeah, let me get back to my presentation here. Okay, um, we had one person ask if there are, um, if there's a cost to the soil test. I think it's like $10 for the basic one. Uh, if you are like a commercial grower and have need of more detailed information than the regular test, it, it can go up from there, but there is a, there is a small fee for that. Okay. Um, another person had a question about um, using a tarp and would that kill Bermuda grass? <laughs> we wish. <laughs> no, actually, it will, it will kill um, the Bermuda, Bermuda grass back uh, at least temporarily. If you keep the soil covered and plant a cover crop over that, I mean, after you tarp it, if you immediately get something planted in there, uh, that can outcompete the Bermuda grass for quite a while. And that, you know, if you have roots of something already growing in the soil, it's hard, a lot harder for something else to move in. But you know how Bermuda sends these creeping rhizomes across the ground. Um, that was another thing, great thing that my chickens did for me <laughs> was to, uh, completely clear my backyard of every last trace of Bermuda grass, but it took uh, three years of letting them run any place where there was grass for them to completely scratch it out. But I, 
I'm, I'm so thrilled that it, it worked as good as it did. Once, once all of the Bermuda was gone, I receded with, um, um, uh, I was going to say Bermuda fescue. And since the chickens had been running over it for three years, it had also been fertilized pretty well and it came up great. And I have not had, that's been uh, three or four years ago and I've not had any Bermudas show up again since then. I know that, that there are chemicals that you can buy that I think Bayer has one that says that it will kill Bermuda selectively. Um, uh, doesn't work. <laughs> Uh, just you have to keep after Bermuda and keep uh, if you can till uh, a strip all the way around your vegetable garden every year that's one thing that a tiller might be useful for is creating a barrier to cut those roots any of the Bermuda that's getting close to your um, you know a newly improved spot um, but yeah Bermuda is a is a pain. Okay, another question is, um, I have a bare spot in my garden waiting for tulip bulbs to be planted in November. What should I do in this area now? Well, one of those really quick growing cover crops like buckwheat or oats, oats um, that'd be perfect. They uh, will be ready in like four weeks. I mean, you can cut them down anytime. It's not like you're waiting for a particular endpoint. When you're ready to till them in, you till them in. Um, since the Tulip bulbs don't really put on much growth. They do a little bit of root growth. Um, I don't think that it would be pulling too much nitrogen out of the soil. Normally you sprinkle a little bit of fertilizer in the hole when you're planting the bulbs. I think that would compensate for any nitrogen that might be tied up by, by tilling or by turning those uh, cover crops in. Great. Um, another person wanted to know where they would be able to get the bag of seed mix that you showed. Um, actually, the seed mix that I got here, I bought off of Amazon. <laughs> um, I do get all of my buckwheat and, and when it's a single mix like buckwheat or oats, the local weed and, weed and seed stores all carry those in bulk and you shouldn't have any trouble finding them. Um, when I had been at the my local store that I go at, they didn't have any of the mixed uh, cover crop seeds in stock right now. Um, he said they get them in a little later. So uh, you can check at your local place or online, just you know, put in cover crop seed mix. And then the same for the chicken foraging seed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I found that online as well. Okay, and then someone asked if you can send out the slide on cover crops. So I went ahead and just copied the link that's down at the bottom into the chat. So anyone should be able Great. to click on that and get to it. Perfect. All right. Well, uh, green manure isn't the only kind of manure you can use. Actually, the brown kind that we're all familiar with. Um, this made me laugh up here on the right was actually on eBay. <laughs> you see that? Somebody's going to pay for seven pounds of fresh manure in an open box <laughs> for $20. And this is the part that made me laugh too. They've already sold 13 of them. <laughs> so if you have access to manures, they add a lot to the soil. And uh, not just the bulking material, the organic material, but actually the, the number of microbes that manure contains is like, you know, a great start um, for improving your fertility. The, with the chicken manure and the rabbit manure, it says that they're hot. That means if you applied those straight to the soil and you had plants growing there, it would uh, probably burn and kill the plants. Um, the warm ones like horse manure and sheep manure do not contain quite as much uh, as high a percentage of nitrogen, so they are not as likely to burn your plants. But horses eat stuff out in the pasture. Their, their horse manure usually has uh, weed seeds in it. Um, sheep manure I have never used, but um, if they're eating on the path, if they're feeding out in the pasture, they're eating a lot of weeds and a lot of those seeds can go through and still be viable once they've uh, ended up in the manure. So I would recommend for both for all of these here, the hot and the warm ones that you definitely compost them uh, before you use them 
or till them in at least a whole season ahead maybe of when you're going to plant stuff so that they have time to um, break down and, and uh, uh, not be so hot by the time you're ready to grow uh, plants. Pig and hog manures, I think, are pretty liquidy. Um, most people aren't going to mess with, uh, unless they have happen to have a source that's easily available to them, they're not likely to use those. But neither of those um, um, are going to burn your plants if you apply it directly to the soil. But again, weed seeds is something to always consider as an issue. I like horse manure. I've gotten it a lot of times from uh, some of the, a good place to get that kind of thing is a, um, any place where they raise horses or board horses, they usually have more than enough. And a lot of times they'll have a pile that they say is, has been sit, sitting there for a season or so. Even when you get those, they have weathered some and they're not likely to be as high in nitrogen, but it's still um, best to compost them because of the weed seeds. With my chickens, they actually do not free range much anymore because now I have a nice lawn. They, <laughs> thanks to them, they uh, they are uh, stuck in a run most of the day. I don't let them out very much to free range, and so the manure from their uh, chicken run is mixed with leaves. I use leaves as a bedding material in there, and so with their feet and their scratching, it gets mixed very well into a. Uh, um, a perfect mix to go into the compost pile and it will compost very quickly and it'll help the other stuff in the compost pile uh, to break down fast. So, you know, you can always use manure, but I recommend uh, composting it before you add it to um, till it into your soil. So really anything that's organic something that was alive uh, is compostable. The reason they tell you, you that you not to use meat or, or uh, fat in your compost is not that it won't break down and make compost, but that it will attract uh, rats or things like that, uh, critters to your pile that you don't really want to encourage. So uh, around here in Kansas, most I mean, in this part of the state, I think most of the soil is more on the um, um, alkaline side where wood ashes would uh, make the pH go up higher than it already is. So most people aren't going to want to add wood ashes to either amend their soils with or your compost pile. If you have just small amounts of them in your compost, uh, you know, if you occasionally um, have a fire pit where you you burn stuff occasionally. Some of those aren't aren't going to be bad, but using a large amount of them would be recommended. The same with newspapers tend to suck a lot of the moisture out of uh, your compost pile. You have to keep it wetted well if you're using shredded newspapers. If you till them in the soil, um, you know where they're covered, they don't tend to dry out as much. But you want to shred them up pretty pretty good before you would want to mix them into the soil. The compost pile is not as picky, but even the lint, the, your sweeper bag, you can empty into the, into the compost pile. Um, if you save your kitchen scraps, you can compost them or you can use them directly in the soil and just dig a little hole every time you go out there with a bucket of kitchen scraps and put it in a new hole um, and just gradually um, fill in an area with, with buried kitchen scraps. You can do that if you don't want to compost them. So all of these, you have the option of either composting or mixing with the soil. Twigs and wood chips, they are going to tie up nitrogen in the soil for the very longest time. Um, and you may need to add um, some nitrogen to the soil if you're going to use wood chips or sawdust also will do the same thing. We'll require a lot of nitrogen from your soil in, it in order to finish digesting it. So you'd want to go um, light on the, on the sawdust and not, uh, not too heavy. Does anybody have questions about uh, what you could use to amend your soil or Some, compost? Someone asked about dryer lint. Most, I mean, a lot of people wear a lot of cotton clothes and uh, um, those will break down fine. We did an experiment with my kids once and buried a pair of underwear <laughs> in the garden and left just the elastic band sticking out of the soil. 
And it only took like two weeks for that, <laughs> for that underwear to be nothing but a band of elastic. So uh, yeah, you know, there's smaller amounts of polyester and things like that are probably in there, but um, you know, I think for the most part, it's pretty safe. My dryer lint tends to have a lot of pet hair mixed in with it. And hair is actually an excellent source of nitrogen for compost piles. So uh, yeah, I'd say throw it in. What about eggshells and coffee grounds? Uh, coffee grounds have a lot of nitrogen in them, even though they are brown in color. When you talk about composting, you talk about green and brown mixes of green and brown. Uh, the coffee grounds are considered a green because they do provide a lot of nitrogen. So they are great in the compost pile. You can also uh, mix them in, uh, in the soil directly. Uh, they have a little bit of acidity, but that is balanced out by the soil pretty quickly. It's not going to uh, really change the pH a whole lot of um, by using coffee grounds. Um, so if you if you have access to them, that's great. And eggshells? Eggshells, um, if you can crush them really finely, they will do the most good. If you, if you leave them in big chunks, microbes can't really digest them very well. But if you run them through the uh, blender real quick, I have a, uh, like a spice mill. It, it actually used to be a, used for grinding coffee beans, but now I use it just for the eggshells and it pretty much powders them. And you can throw that in your compost um, pile that way. Um, you can also sprinkle once they're, uh, if they're a little rougher, if they're not broken down that much, when they are in a little bit bigger pieces, they can actually keep pests away from some of your plants. If you put them in a circle around the base of your plants, uh, uh, bugs, slugs and things like that don't like crawling over them. So it may have some, some effect on keeping slugs out of your garden, but um, yeah, the eggshells have a lot of calcium and they will uh, make their way into the soil slowly, uh, but they're a great amendment too. That it? That's Any it. Questions? Okay. So, you know, trying to decide, should I compost this first or should I, you know, just use it directly? Um, the, the pros on the side of composting the organic matter before you add it to the soil means that you're going to increase the, the microbes because they multiply like crazy in the pile. And as the pile starts to cool down at the end of composting, it becomes recolonized by fungus, which are really great in the soil. Although the the fungal uh, structures they call mycorrhizal fungal actually grow in conjunction with roots, uh, wrap themselves around the roots and connect um, one plant to another, one tree to another. They uh, act as uh, uh, transport highways for nutrients to go in the soil. So if you're increasing, if you're composting, you're increasing the kinds of organisms you really want to encourage in your soil. So it's like giving you a heads up on on getting started on that. Um, when I said the wood chips and sawdust can tie up the nitrogen. Um, so if you compost that first, um, you aren't gonna have the issues with needing to add additional nitrogen before you plant in the soil after adding it. Um, if you are good at composting and you can get that temperature up to be like 160 degrees, that is high enough to kill most weed seeds and uh, pathogens. If you had, if you accidentally had a few plants in there that had uh, some kind of disease, a hot compost pile will uh, help destroy those as well. So if you, you know, you don't want to incorporate any disease material, um, digging it in or anything like that. But if you have some in the compost pile, it's less dangerous there than it is uh, to put it directly into your soil. Um, Compost is just, you know, it's, it's more sponge-like when it's being tilled in. And so it is right off the bat is better at holding on to any moisture where if you're tilling in dry leaves and dry compost, it takes them a little while to get saturated and, and um, to start working well with the soil mo moisture. And the uh, compost, once all those organic materials have been broken down and first they're broken into acids and, and further broken into uh, smaller and smaller particles, um, that helps them be able to buffer 
conditions in the soil better than than just straight organic matter is. Um, so you'll get better soil structure faster with compost because compost, if you've seen well-made compost, it, it looks and feels a lot like really good soil. The only thing it's missing is like the mineral content that, that soils have. Um, so it's easier because it's small particles and stuff. It's, it's really easy to, to turn in a couple of inches of, of compost into the soil where if you've got leaves and twigs and stuff, it's a little harder to get them all, all well mixed. Um, you can make your own compost. You can also buy bagged compost at, you know, Walmart or uh, Johnson's or pretty much any place that sells uh, garden supplies would have uh, bags of compost that you can buy. And um, with, with being able to recycle stuff and keep it out of the waste stream, that's an important consideration for me for composting is just uh, not to be having so much stuff going into the trash. Um, that's an aspect that first got me into, into uh, uh, composting was the ability just to recycle stuff and not create so much trash. <laughs> Um, the con, I guess, the, the only one that I could really think of is that, you know, it takes extra time and effort uh, to do. I thought these were really pretty barrels that somebody, I'm not sure if this is a commercially available system or if this is one somebody made uh, themselves, but it's, it's pretty cool looking. But you really need nothing, no special supplies to have a compost pile. You need a place to, to put your materials. Um, having an enclosure, make sure they don't blow away and, and keep them um, in one spot until it's finished composting. But, you know, you can just take a corner of your yard if you have fences around your yard. Uh, just a corner of the fence is a good place for uh, building your pile. And, and uh, um, the only advantage, I think, of buying the expensive containers like these plastic buckets is that if you have trouble with mice or small rodents getting into your stuff, they really can't get into those kind of barrels. So you, some people have more than one type of system going. They may have an open pile where they uh, compost most of their grass and, and leaves and, and small twigs and then have a separate, maybe a container like this where they put most of their uh, kitchen wastes in. Um, you can add kitchen waste to the other piles too and it won't attract uh, rodents if you bury it in the pile so it's not really on the surface or um, a really good way to make sure that pests aren't interested in it is to just blend all of your compost stuff real quick in the blender before you pour it on the pile. Once it's all chopped up like that it breaks down really really fast and it won't attract uh, a lot of the pests because, you know, it's too small for them. <laughs> so you have options. You don't have to uh, compost if you don't want to, but it is a great way of recycling the material that you probably already have in your yard. So keep it covered. <laughs> That's the main, main point here is that bare soil is uh, how you turn soil into dirt. You've got to keep it covered if it's mulch, if it's crops, if it's um, green manures, it really doesn't matter. Even if it's weeds, weeds will protect the soil better than if it was bare. Um, so those plant roots I told you before, how most of them are associated with the, with the uh, root hairs, that having them nearby um, will keep your population of soil microbes high year round. And that means that the nutrients will be supplied evenly and as your plants need them and there won't be um, um, times of the year where your plants are waiting for microbes to catch up with their needs. So the dormant seasons and in between crops are a good chance when there's nothing there. Uh, it's a lot easier to work, it works organics into the soil when it's bare, obviously. Uh, but just keeping it covered with uh, wheat straw. Um, if you don't have anything else, um, I buy a bale of that for like $6 or so, and that covers a lot of ground. And we'll, um, if there's a new area that I worked up with cardboard, which I, I did this year, put down cardboard and, and covered it with straw. And um, 
I'm going to throw the compost that I have this fall on top of that and let it sit all winter and it will be ready to plant through in the spring. I don't, I'm not going to be able to get a, a cover crop in there yet because um, the cardboard and the straw aren't really, uh, the seed wouldn't have good contact with the soil there. So I'm not going to try planting the cover crop on top of the cardboard. Um, when you keep the cover, the, the soil completely covered, you're not going to have light getting to the weed seeds. Um, if you're not tilling as much, you're not going to be bringing up new weed seeds. Um, so it really has a, a big impact on the amount of, needing, of, of weeding that's needed. There's a, a community garden that I've been volunteering with this year that has Johnson grass and bindweed and poison ivy as uh, there are three main cover crops <laughs> and we've been working very diligently to get rid of them and uh, this winter or this fall we plan to plant cover crops in there and, and see uh, how good it's going to be at, at inhibiting any of those. We have been having to till that garden um, because of the Johnson grass and the, and the bindweed but we're hoping that by keeping it covered all winter and using a cover crop that maybe the weed pressure will be a lot less next year. That's what we're expecting. Um, it also moderates the soil temperature um, by having it covered. It's shaded so it doesn't get as hot uh, in summer and doesn't dry out as fast so the plants are less stressed uh, so you get better growth out of them. Uh, it also keeps the soil mo moist. Um, they've shown that if you have healthy soil that's got a lot of organics and stuff in it, in the event of a drought, um, you will still get production from a healthy soil. You can still have, even when it's stressed by drought, it's going to do way better than dirt or soil that's, that's unimproved. And it's um, with the climate being in kind of a flux now where it's getting hotter or you have flash flood type uh, situations, having soil that's able to act as a sponge helps even out uh, that keeps uh, roots from rotting when it does rain heavy because it uh, absorbs a lot of the moisture and has pore spaces that allows the roots to still breathe even when there is a lot of moisture in the soil. Um, you also will get a lot more earthworms and um, millipedes and uh, beetles and all the other kinds of um, insects and pollinators. Uh, that will help deal with in, any insect problems that, that show up. I know that uh, I see aphids maybe on a plant in the spring. I'll have a, a pretty a week where I'll see aphids like eating everything. If I don't do anything, if I just wait another week, suddenly all those aphids are gone. They're, they've just been consumed. So sometimes we treat, we're too anxious to get out the spray when it's uh, when you see something like that crop up, uh, sometimes if you just hand pick those individual bugs that you see, like squash bugs, it, it can drive you crazy. The Japanese beetles, if you're having trouble with those, um, but really hand picking uh, is still a better solution than than grabbing some chemicals and and spraying them around, unless you you know absolutely don't have any other other options is they do affect more than just the plants that, that you put them on. Um, I think the more that you go with improving your soil organically, uh, the less need that you'll have for chemicals. Um, if you're starting a new, play, a new garden and you've had bindweed and, uh, and Bermuda in that spot that have been there for years and you've been fighting them for years, that may be the one time that you want to go out and spray some Roundup um, is just to give you a clean slate to start with or you'll be battling some of those things forever. So I'm not, I'm not saying never use chemicals, but really uh, think about it before you do. Like I said, the um, application of Roundup changes the uh, um, microbes that are in the soil. It kills a lot of good ones. Uh, it takes a while to replace those. If you spray the Roundup and then you don't do any organic 
um, supplementing, you may have actually created more of a, a, a soil that's, that's going to lead to sick plants than, than having helped it. So um, just be cautious with it. You don't want to spend money just to have it run off and, and end up in the groundwater either. If you're going to spend money on it, you want to get your bang for your buck. Um, so they have shown that when you treat with anything pretty much that the earthworms will move deeper in the soil or move away uh, and stay away until those salts have completely left the, the soil. And um, the eggs that are left behind by those earthworms don't hatch in the soil either. So you've kind of killed the, the worms and their babies for the next uh, period of time. It's going to take a while for those to repopulate the soil. Uh, could be, they say when you till, it takes an entire year for the bacteria, the microbes to recover from the disruption. It's mainly the fungus that you disrupt when you, uh, when you till that takes so long to, to uh, reconnect and, and reestablish. Bacteria are faster, but um, it can take anywhere from one to three years, depending on how, how much tilling was done before, you know, those uh, organisms can recover. Just like um, they say, when you take antibiotics, it takes an entire year for your gut to uh, completely um, replace all the organisms that were lost with a, with a healthy, healthy group of uh, organisms. So, you know, follow the directions and wear gloves, do everything it says on the label. Don't just uh, say, well, you know, if you can buy it at the um, Lowe's or Home Depot, uh, that it should be safe. You really need to pay attention to where you wear gloves or respirators, even with some of them, but um, use them smartly. So do we have more questions? We do have some and uh, I can start reading them. And then if anyone else has questions, they can add them to the chat. Uh, the first, we have two about compost. Uh, the first one is, I have a compost bucket for kitchen scraps. How do I add it to a compost pile? Do I need a leaf pile or grass clipping pile to keep adding to keep the mix right? I just kind of add those as I have them available because you can't really stockpile kitchen waste. So if you have le leaves and and most of my grass clippings, I don't bag them. I just let them go back on the yard. But if the lawn gets too tall, sometimes occasionally I'll, I'll use a bagger and so I'll have some, some grass clippings. But leaves, yeah, are a great mix with them. If you just, if you don't have a lot of leaves or other things, like I said, just go out with a, a spade and dig a little hole and dump, dump the whole bucket of, of waste in there and then uh, put the dirt back on and, and dig the hole right next to it the next time you take a bucket out. Um, within a month or two, those will be complete. You won't find any residue left in that hole if you go back and redig it. Great. And then there's another similar question. I have access to lots of green material. Where do I get the brown material to balance out? Oh, well, um, I know people who in the fall go around and wait till their neighbors have bagged their leaves and left them at the curb and then go take some of those bags and pile them up behind your garage <laughs> so that you can have a stockpile to work with. Um, other than that, um, I would say like, like I have the bale of straw, I'm using straw, but really you shouldn't have to purchase anything to make it. And if you just have uh, uh, kitchen scraps, then maybe consider a worm composting bin, which uh, is something that you would have indoors. Um, and they will, those little red wiggler worms that you put in a worm compost eat their body weight, uh, double their body weight, I think every single day. So they can chow down. If you have, you know, um, a handful of kitchen scraps every day, uh, a tub about the size, not much bigger than a couple of shoe boxes uh, could take care of all of those. And they use, use like some shredded newspaper and the worms and your kitchen scraps and it turns into beautiful worm compost. There are, if you have questions about where to access more uh, information like that, check with um, the Cedric County Extension, the uh, gardening hotline, they are great people that can answer questions for you. This, um, the second resource I have listed there is a Kansas garden guide. I highly recommend everybody 
getting either a hard copy of that at the extension office or download it. The link there, uh, you can download it yourself, but it has um, not only uh, questions on particular vegetables, but it has a whole whole section on how to compost um, and soil improvement and individual like planting dates for if you want to start broccoli or you want to grow whatever, it'll tell you what the proper time of year is for that. So um, uh, those are great resources for gardening information. Great. There's another question. I have a prolific ground cover. Unfortunately, it is creeping Charlie from a neighbor's yard. Bermuda <laughs> does not affect it. What can I do to smother it or must I use a chemical? I would try the tarp, you know, this time of year with the heat, uh, the heat in addition to uh, the, the, you know, keeping it from getting any light um, should be able to take care of that. You give it a month or six weeks, I think it could even take on creeping Charlie. And then when you pull the tarp off, put down cardboard to keep any light from getting back to that. If it's partially alive, if it gets some sunlight, it might try regrowing. Uh, so keep it covered at least until winter comes and uh, that should finish it off, I think. Okay, there are two more questions. Uh, the next one is anything out there to work into clay soil to lighten it? Uh, cover crops with radishes, the daikon radish are great at breaking up clay because they have a thick, heavy tap root that's like, uh, you know how you can rent those machines that will do core aeration? These are like, instead of the little tiny spikes they have that, that pull up little cores to loosen up your soil, you have this giant radish that forces its way down into the clay and breaks it up. And if you let it die in place as it rots, it will provide the organic matter and really uh, loosen up the clay a lot. You cannot add sand and expect it to loosen up clay. Uh, it, it seems like that would be a good idea, but just the volume of sand that would be required to balance the clay is so massive that you can't possibly get the right mix by, by using sand. So organic matter is always going to be your best bet for either breaking up clay or making sand hold more water. It works in both situations to really improve the, the drainage. But if you have bad clay, I would say do at least a season of cover crop. It will make such a huge difference. Okay. Are there a few fertilizers that you recommend? Um, I mentioned that I have chickens and that's the only fertilizer I have used on my yard for the last several years. I only have five chickens, but uh, that's pretty much uh, between the compost and, and uh, spreading the chicken manure. That's about all I use. Um, I would say go by your soil test uh, results because a lot of people add a lot of fertilizers when they really don't need them. Sometimes the, the reason that you don't think your plants are getting the nutrients they need is because the pH of your soil is off a little bit. A lot of times those nutrients are only available to plants in a very narrow pH range. And once you adjust the pH, suddenly all the nutrition your plants need are, are right there. Um, so I guess I'd say, you know, use your soil test, but basically um, nitrogen is usually the, the only thing that most soils are really in need of and a green cover crop provides the nitrogen. Great. Then one last question. Do you recommend spreading gypsum over winter for clay soil? You know, they used to say that, that gypsum was the key for clay soil and uh, research-based, this is K-State, gypsum won't, doesn't do anything. It really won't improve your soil. Um, I wouldn't spend your money on it. They a lot of the garden center, the places that still sell gypsum will tell you that it that it works. But if you uh, talk to the extension people, the agents, uh, they will tell you that that gypsum um, that's kind of a gardening myth. So go with organic matter instead, compost, leaves. Great. 
Okay, I think that's all of our questions. I'd like to thank Lori for tonight's presentation and Matthew McKernan and the K-State Extension staff for their partnership on this series.